Hello everyone, thanks so much for coming. Um, it's kind of a real privilege to be here with Alan because I've known him for a long time. I know he hates flattery, so I'm just going to continue with this. Um, I've known him for a long time, but I know, knew him first. Uh, he, reviewed one of my, he reviewed my MFA show. So we kind of interacted with each other through words at first. Um, so he reviewed my MFA show and then I started reviewing him. I reviewed him lots of times. <laughs> I haven't reviewed this show yet, but um, You don't have to, I don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I always found his work really interesting in that I've always felt that he was kind of boxed in in Ireland in the sense that there's kind of an internationalism about him. That his work is kind of quite expansive and it kind of changes so, um, and it adapts into different forms and it's very free in that way. And I think we talked about this before, you know, he's, he was educated in New York, especially art education, so I think that had an influence on you. So I've always felt like that you were bigger than the art scene, okay? I'm saying this, <laughs> not you. And uh, you're kind of um, hard to contain. So there's a kind of intensity, this shape-shifting thing, I think is in your work. And one of the first um, works I saw was in Mother's Tank Station, and it was Odo from Star Trek, who is a shape-shifter. So um, there was something really, like even referencing Star Trek, I think that was interesting, because I was a fan of Star Trek as well especially uh, Deep Space Nine, and all the stuff was going on. And then there's a kind of intensity and an honesty, and I know you say sometimes, like, you're a really good writer, and but sometimes your failing is that you're too honest, yeah. which is a weird thing, because I like that, honesty and criticality. So, and you also have a way with words, and as has manifested here in a kind of very strange way. But it's not the breath, of your use of words. Um, like when you review, uh, if there's not too much editors at it, I think it can be really raw and witty and critical, most importantly. Um, so that's an introduction, okay? Um, so another thing is this, I think we should get out of the way this, this jolly process. Way. Well, kind of, because you've talked a lot about this in other interviews and even on RTE radio as well. You talked about twice, it. twice, yeah. So we don't want to go down that road again. So if you can sum it up in like three lines or four lines, what is this jolly process? Because we kind of have to talk about it because there's some photographs in the room yeah. that are, that use that jolly pho photographic process. Jolly screen. Jolie screen. I'm calling Jolie, okay? So. Jolie. Okay, Jolie. It'd be an L-E-Y if it wasn't. But yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's a colour photography process. It's an additive process. There's two parts to the image. It's what you're seeing is the, ca the film that was in the camera. So it's a colour process that's made from light, not chemistry. So you've got a black and white sheet film and a colored screen that's made of stripes that are red, green, and blue. The paintings are giant versions of that. That's the connection. Um, like, there is a lot of, like, you know, you talk about in your mission statement or your artist statement, I won't say mission statement, Topic. your artist statement that you're interested in artworks that, you know, have a narrativity, that there's something, there's always this storytelling behind it. Yeah. But like, what, like, I'm interested in someone coming in here without all that stuff, yeah. without all that referencing. Like, what do they see? Do they are they seduced by these things? Are they? I hope so. Are they fetishistic? Like, no. um, the way they're cropped off. There's something, you know. You're interested in flowers. You're interested in, like, lots of things to do the body, and you know, there's yeah. something more beyond, you know, narrativity and referencing. There's something else. Is there? Well, they might be fetishist -y sort of, but they're not super sexual. And I yeah. kind of worked against any kind of erotic -y kind of queer narrative thing happening in it, but referencing that all the time. Yeah. So it's sort of like there's maybe a Robert Maplethorpe reference, but I'm fully clothed and I'm not some fetishizing some black model with a huge penis or something. It's all kind of, and there's Mike, there's one where there's a kind of a banana protector stuck in my pants, which looks like a big dick but it's not it's just mm -hmm. and it's blue but it's 
Because and the feather, you use a f- and the feather, feather as well, like downstairs, yeah. yeah, which is sort of. Well, they were working off. You know, we've been connected a while. That was a publication mm-hmm. you did, um, where I just grabbed a bunch of, or selected, a bunch of images from a kind of retro Tumblr porn, retro porn Tumblr site um, called Michael Kant. <laughs> Um, with a K, so it's okay. <laughs> and, um, sub- but it was a kind of a weird fetish Tumblr. When Tumblr was all sex and all mostly porn before it became, I know nothing now. It's I don't know what it does, but it was a, at a certain point it was a really good ar- visual archive resource for creative people and, and artists and stuff and you could just dump lots of stuff online and then some artists slash curator types kind of created and amassed these huge collections of images which are really interesting um, in between all the hardcore porn which is sort of mostly what filled up all the da- all the databases or all the, the servers of Tumblr that's all been eradicated mostly I think when Yahoo took over that they kind of purged it and it's but it just went out of fashion, Instagram arrived and sort of killed it anyway. Anyway, that was sort of a, a selection. I was really intrigued. There was a, there's, there's a lot of, um, a lot of these collections were kind of, of uh, or, or Tumblr pages had these um, archive photographs or vintage photographs that were from God knows where, or they're, especially in America, there's a bigger circulation of like flea market images and stuff. So there's, photo albums and people's weird collections of things that sort of end up online. Um, you don't get that as much here. That was like a big part of upstate New York and stuff because it's Kodak land and there was always tons of photography stuff in flea markets. It was really interesting just to, it was just kind of everywhere. And they also had this big thing about being the imaging capital of the world, even though it's really ugly. <laughs> it's a horrible place to live. And it's just like, but they have this, uh, uh, lots of technology in the codec and stuff. Anyway. So you mentioned Robert Mapletorp, and I don't want to bring you down to sex talk too much, but um, <coughs> like you talk about Ma- Robert Mapletorp and Felix Gonzalez Therese, and there's somewhere you're in the middle of those two in a sense that um, there's a kind of tenderness or something, or you're kind of covering up a little bit, whereas Mapletorp is not covering up. Yeah. And then Felix Gonzalez Therese is kind of abstracted completely he's abstracting it so like do you feel that you're kind of in that space because there is a sexualized thing in your work in a sense that you know you had a show in Una Young called Handjob yeah and I when I wrote about that I talked about using that word as a title that that was quite explicit to write you know and then I started to look at the art scene as being quite conservative that yeah no one else you know usually it's a kind of oxymoron uh, title or it's something quite poetic or a lyrical or, sentence yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Sentence. so there was something very explicit kind of about that but it could be i know you're talking about your hand and you you had yeah. injured yourself and it was it was called hand job it wasn't true was playing with that yeah there's a painting there is it there innuendo or oh, downstairs yeah. yeah um so you do play with innuendo i think a little bit and there's something there in that. So, like, what when we come to an exhibition of yours, is there like what's going on? What is the the tone or the mood or you know? Is that too much? There are no, no, no. I think th- I mean there's a lot of different reference points that I like to shove in, and I really liked like the hand job thing was was that that particular project. It was a curated show of thirteen odd artists who all had bits of hands in the work they were making. And I kind of had come across these people. And, and also I, I kind of was, not kind of, what I was doing with that particular project was trying to just recover a practice after having a arm, a hand injury and not being able to do anything for ages. I started posting hand photographs on Facebook and then people started sending me hand photographs and it was a bit of a laugh and I was communicating only through hands. And for about six months I wasn't sending, writing any, amazing statements on Facebook or whatever. This is like in 2011 when Facebook was still used by people. Um, and for like saying interesting things. So that, so then I, but 
so the, 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 an, a, an idea for a project emerged, and this a, does have a reason why I'm explaining this, because it's part of a particular process that's kind of convoluted, but it gets to a certain point. But what I like to do is make the, the research part of it slightly explicit, or in, as in available, and then um, work towards that. But it's sort of about transparency of a process, where you're kind of showing how you're coming about quite complex ideas, possibly. So, and then, and, and, and while I'm kind of very gently breaking rules along the way, so as an artist curated exhibition for Uni Young, which is a, you know, a, a kind of a weird commercial space that's not really commercial, it's more of a project space. And um, the artists I selected for the exhibition were only artists I'd met on residencies that I'd been on over the last 10 years. So I'd been on a bunch of different residencies in different countries. So that's a really shit criteria, really bad criteria, really, really super subjective for selecting anybody. And then I also picked bits of artworks that had the hand, but I kind of rejected 70% of the thing that they were making and just asked them for the hand bit. And then there was no budget for it. So I was like, so can I also remake it? So I ended up remaking a lot of the work as well. So, and, and so like I met, a really great artist in Argentina who was from uh, Colum no, he was from, um, uh, oh my God, not Colombia, not Ecuador, anyway, Central America somewhere. Argentina. Just escapes, no, um, Ecuador. Bolivia. Venezuela. Bolivia. He was from Bolivia. And um, <laughs> I wasn't going to get him over, I wasn't going to get the artwork over, but it was just, he had a very, these very simple, like, he had about three or four pieces in the show, but they were all e really easy to remake. Like one was five rubber gloves that had of different colors of, from one hand that had fingers snipped and the colors just swapped between fingers. You just go to pound shop and buy different colored gloves and really simple. And it wasn't, and he was kind of, he's sort of performance related artist and he had like a ring in an, inside a set inside an ice cube. Like lovely, simple, but hardcore pieces that like said a lot. And, and anyway, there was that particular pile of work, lots of different people, a, a range of people from artists through to photographers through to, I mean, if somebody works as a photographer, not, doesn't see them as an artist, let me newspaper. Then there was an art critic, uh, an art historian uh, wrote a text about um, Arthur Conan Doyle. It's, it's going to get very convoluted. But anyway, there's a... From that text, I ended up making a film um, that used all the reference points from the, from the exhibition and uh, created this very, very, very complex yet structured system. Um, the, I had collected photographs of hands, like I said, through this in social media exchange. That They became the structure for the film that then every shot was a recreation of this hand, these hand photographs. The photographs were chosen because they had text that became the dialogue. Then the narrative was based on a Sherlock Holmes uh, story that kind of had a hands and ears connection. And it was all kind of weirdly connected in a very convoluted way. But if you'd gone through the journey <laughs> um, with me, like now, without going to sleep or getting very confused, it all made sense. And it was like it was all fairly explicit as to how that complicated process towards making this weirdly structured film that um, was essentially a kind of a murder romance thing. It was a melodrama, mm -hmm. uh, very legible in the end. It was like love, jealousy, and murder. What, so it's, what was good about the Uni Young show, and I'm gonna, I wanna talk about tech start. Yeah, we have next. to, don't we? That's what we um, what I like about doing a young show is that your authorship as an artist kind of disappeared into all the other artists. Because yeah. when you went to the show, it was kind of like, who, who owns this? Like, and you created other people's work, but you created in the way you see things yeah. and you connected things. So and because it was artist curated, they were kind of like, yeah, whatever, it's cool. This isn't like a big show and we have to show stuff and sell stuff. We're just interested in the mad turn around and, and topsy to everything that you're going to be doing. That's interesting, doing. isn't it? Because it was artists involved, yeah. it wasn't curators involved, yeah. where things would have changed. Yeah, there was like a, and they were friends. And so it wasn't yeah. this sort of big professional exercise in making 
unimportant exhibition about stuff. It was having a bit of fun. And, it was fun. and, and the, work you, the work you do has fun in it. It yeah. is fun. It is humorous. It, yeah. it is, even though it has all this referencing and citing. <coughs> yeah, it's not poker. It's, yeah, so it's, 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 I do believe, I do believe in, in having a sense of humour. Okay. Yeah. I think it's important. Lots of art doesn't. And it sort of it depends on which camp you're in. There's some okay. artists kind of go, you, anything with humour is just not art. It's just, you can't. You have to be serious. You cannot smile, crack a smile. You can't crack a joke. You can't have these cross references that kind of make fun or ridicule or are ironic or something. Not that I'm trying to be ironic anymore, but you know, it's... I'm, like, it's I'm going to pick you on that, the irony thing, and then we go into the text. Fine. Um, you're from, it's like, uh, I was reading this interview recently, and it's an artist that we, we really respect, Larry Johnson. And like, you'll see, is Larry appearing? Larry yeah, Larry. Yeah, is okay. Larry? <laughs> so, Larry Johnson is a strange character in that he's kind of, as you say, very intense. He's a post-structuralist. He, he is breaking down language. He's quite ironic. And there's an um, interview with him, with David Riminelli, and he talks about how he refers to him, uh, he refers to himself as a, a postmodern, an editor, um, a young postmodern. So he oh, talks really? about his, his training yeah. as a young postmodern. Right. I think it's the, the loveliest. I've never heard anyone say that. I think it's great. But it's kind of, um, you come from a generation, I'm not saying that you're old, but you're, you're from a generation that. Same age as her. Irony, <laughs> irony is important. It's, to me, is it, to me, it's a really important irony. I come out of that generation, the nineties, li looking at nineties American TV, irony, Tarantino, all that kind right. of stuff is ironical. Yeah, and it's make it's kind of reflecting on itself being ridiculous, and there's all this stuff going on, and everything ends up bad in the end, in a, in a certain way. It's determined to, you know, end up. You know, it was the end of history. Life is shit. Know? Yeah, life is shit. You know, it was the end of history, and that never happened. Yeah. So that's the tragedy of postmodernism. Is that yeah. it was supposed to be like when, when I was in college, that was like the epistemic. Final moment in human development was postmodernism, and that's the kind of that particular point in education that it was mm -hmm. at. It was like the pinnacle of civilization was now, and this was it. And it couldn't get any better or worse, and and it just rolled on and everybody rolled over postmodernism. So I did my thesis. My, my first kind of foray into photography was a photography thesis for my undergrad. Mm -hmm. And it was about taking four different postmodern theories mm -hmm. uh, and re-photograph or um, around the theme of the seven deadly sins, that thing that all art students do as well. Um, and lots of artists subsequently as well. Lots of people do it uh, through their careers, it seems. Because it's like a classic narrative, you know, grand narrative, da da da. And um, so it was good to, so I kind of um, always kind of called myself happily postmodern until I realized that the art world sees it as a, a blip that happened for about a year or two. And then we kind of rolled on and did something else. Mm -hmm. Even though the theory and the ideas behind it kind of still inform an awful lot of what goes on. But the art world is like, has just a, a faster way of circulating, consuming and moving on mm -hmm. with lots of complex ideas. And then they come back again in some other form because you've got like, if my art world started with Craig Owens and stuff, people like that and illustrated through Barbara Kruger and Jenny Holster and that pictures generation especially that's where I kind of learned about art and then first without understanding it did a really quite ignorant and clueless photography thesis not really because it was an art school I wasn't being lectured in it I was kind of learning it on the side and and through stuff other people were in my class group were making videos and radio programs and stuff and there was a few of us doing photography but not many but also then there was a, in DCU at the time, it was communication studies. There was also a very strong culture studies drive within the course, which had come from London and which had come from like all that early, late eighties kind of uh, Stuart Hall stuff that, and that had happened. Um, and and RT, my professors were educated there. They brought it back to Ireland and they were kind of pretty advanced 
way ahead of UCD and Trinity in the in the late eighties, actually, because they weren't really teaching that stuff. So we were like, uh, so then that also equipped me really well going to America, where I just needed to go and learn how to make things because I knew what I wanted to make, kind of, or I knew the I had the foundation that everybody was really struggling to catch up with when French theory was like everything needed, we need we need to know about it really quickly, whereas we had had like speed lessons in Derrida, like one, you know, speed lectures and like, cause it was communication. So everything was very, you know, instrumentalized. You had to just lash through it, just to understand it, get a gist of it, know what you're talking about, move on. And, and it, and it gives, gave me that kind of confidence that you get from the art school education, which is that supreme arrogance of like, yeah, I'm an artist, you know, <laughs> which is, that's taken me a long time. Mm to get over. <laughs> so I still don't feel, I know I do feel okay about it now, but I... But do you feel the current moment washing over you in a certain way that because there's these other terms that are kind of thrown around that don't really catch or stick. Yeah. Like metamodernism and, and these kind of terms. Yeah, it's funny, like, isn't it? Yeah. It's about yeah. like sincerity, about not, like about being aware of irony but also being sincere. So you have films like, or you have TV programs like Modern Family, mm. where it's, it's ironic, it's, our irony is playing out, but at the end of it, they reflect on that and they make up, and it's kind of, you know, is it, it ironic? There's a moral, you know, there's, well, they're, they're aware of our irony, but mm. they're more on the side of sincerity, you know? Yeah, but, I mean, I think that the big problem I had to get over was this sort of pastiche and parody dynamic or binary that you have or that kind of fact and versus fiction monolith that's in that particular discourse because you're either one or the other and it's like yeah really yeah you can and it's sort of about referencing stuff that's what I found eventually more comfortable about rather than being p the, the pure appropriation of just totally copying stuff I completely misunderstood that and I recreated things <laughs> so thinking that was appropriation because I went no you can't just copy something directly that's not that's surely not a creative act you have to actually remake it completely and that's appropriation which actually it is now when people talk about cultural appropriation they talk about stealing ideas not actually just stealing the entire thing so like it's the Richard Prince photographing the Marlboro ads they were actually Marlboro's he photographed. He wasn't you know, photographing cowboys. It was the actual thing. And then he, you know, but then he moved on to Instagram and just photographed Instagram. So. Well, he's a postmodern as well. So. He is, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, text, so text art, okay? And right. I'm not going to call it text art because if you put text art into Google, it comes up with these horrible images of people constructed out of text. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, so how it's funny. Kind of like words and then it becomes silhouettes of. But text words. art is a thing. We're it making is, it a thing well, again. We're aren't saying we? that it's text <laughs> as art. Right. Okay. okay. So myself and Alan, uh, our editors, alongside Laura Fitzgerald of this book here, which Alan thinks looks really rough. That looks great. It's um, true. Okay. The screen printed text related. In that, issue, in that issue, Alan is a contributor, so there's six contributors in it. So out of that, um, some ideas of text started to emerge. And as you've seen or listened, Alan kind of, there's something, you, you have a show and then something connects and then you expand that idea from yeah. the show and it kind of... I tend to bounce between exhibitions. Some one element of that here will become the next exhibition, or there's an idea that is underutilized, or side sort of idea that then just gets expanded for the next thing. So there's a yeah, there's a quite a funny sequence through a lot of what I do. Not always, but like there's been a, a few standalone things too. But this particular these paintings come directly from this publication, which was like I've always used text in some way and always been interested in writing and and so the in the, like the first proper bunch of work I did in my MFA actually was the, were photographs with text underneath them about this trip to the southwest of America and and they were they weren't labels they were kind of parallel kind of commentaries on 
the history of the area, about its nuclear history and its cowboy history and how these things conflate it. And, um, and that's like, you know, Jesus, we always make the same work for our entire careers. We never stop making the same painting, the same piece of work. So it's like you've got three ideas and you keep repeating them. Maybe, but not really. Not with you, I don't think, because as you no. said earlier, you kind of do I, lots of things. Yeah, I do kind of, it. yeah, I do, I do. But I, I find that they're all really tightly connected and it's really boring and tedious, actually. But, but with this, this project, for these paintings, it started, they, the first draft of it was through the Tone magazine. And, and it was, uh, like, we came, you asked me and Laura to, be, to help you on this publication, and we, both then, we all then got obsessed by just making big, long lists of lots of people who make text art. And, and then my contribution uh, was sort of a commentary on text art and artists who have done that. Uh, and then these paintings are kind of edited from those particular comments and some of the characters and stuff and the... Um, ideas are expanded a little bit more and differently but with the publication we were looking at people who there's very few artists whose prime work is only text but there's some loads and loads of artists who make really amazing bodies of work with text in between other things as well and I think that's been my interest is finding those kind of artists so being a kind of a teeny budget publication we didn't have money to kind of approach big famous people so We've well, got, we got, we got a few, people. yeah. Mm -hmm. We got like Jack Pearson and stuff, and Laurie yeah. Provost, and, and they've all been super fantastic and amazing to work with, uh, and generous with their artwork. But yeah, yeah, just like just to give you a breath. background on text in Ireland, text art in Ireland, it's kind of a strange phenomenon because um, as someone who goes to graduate shows and kind of reviews them and stuff, you see it in graduate work or uh, in exhibitions at the, you know, the end of uh, you know, NCAE, you know the exhibition you have, or in Dunleary. You see artists like writing the walls, they're very young though, and they write, they do, they're doing text work, but you don't really see it as that. They're kind of um, diary kind of entries or something like that. And it's weird that it doesn't graduate into the art scene proper, because I feel that in a way text is not uh, you say it in your press release, there's something about commodity. Um, it, it's kind of anti-commodity in, in a certain way, you know? It's like Lawrence Wiener, you know, the late Lawrence Wiener, you know, mm. writing on walls and stuff like that, even though he's a big artist and he is part of the art market and all that stuff. There's something about it that is against the object um, or it kind of dissolves or something like that. Whereas, like here you've brought text and painting together in a commercial gallery. And the setting of that in, in this kind of, this setting of this house, this is a Georgian kind of uh, house, it's, there's something jarring about the, that conflation of all those things together. Right. Painting, text, commercial gallery, Georgian, all those things together. Do you feel that there's <laughs> a tension between those things? Here. No. <laughs> well, you sell many of them. That's what I'm saying. I don't know if you're going to sell that many. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's you know. I mean, I, I think they're. It's my first stab at doing painting thing. Kind of. I've kind of done lots of different painting things over the years. Actually, but never had a proper painting show. And then this isn't even because it's corrupted by sculptures and photographs. So it's not even that pure. Um, but actually, there is a there are, there are there is a kind of a very small history of. A sh it, it stops and starts of, of text art in Ireland as well. Like you can't like not think of Shane Cullen and and yeah. and, and some kind of and and it, it, in a small country maybe he just hoovered up the kind of the text section of the what the art community here could cope with and nobody else wanted to you know tread on his footsteps and stuff. Although he's sort of uh, not so visible anymore, but he was like you know big noise for a while and especially having seen the. The image show with the giant corridor of text um, over the last year, but it's not about him; it's about me. Um, <laughs> but I was really, I was really interested in in trying to find a way of connecting, because that's what I kind of try. What I do try to do is try and connect different parts of my life together all the time through the art, in the way that lots of artists do. Your art's a function of yourself, your background, your education, the jobs you do. So. The archive stuff I do leeches in 
as historical reference points and bad archiving in lots of ways of like not creating counter narratives, not telling a story properly, mixing up historical reference points to manipulate them to tell a particular story, which is totally postmodern. Um, and that's what Mr. Putin does all the time. And, and that's how, you know, he weaponized postmodern kind of, you know, techniques for his propaganda and stuff, which has been really interesting to kind of read about because it's so basic. And yet we're still stuck in that particular mode, which is pretty relevatory in the last few years as that all came out when he kind of, is it Magliev or I can't remember the name of his propaganda guy who kind of turned a lot of what they were calling art techniques, which is basic kind of, you know, is it real or is it not? And we are kind of in this faking lots of stuff and, and, and that kind of um, faking stuff but commenting on the real world being a simulacrum and all that kind of bold riara kind of debate that's all kind of faded away into kind of the myths of time really quickly um, so anyway it was kind of it's what I like here is sort of combining the, the, the my way of writing but then having these tiny little edits and snippets and trying to be it was made quite quickly and there were decisions to 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 make the work was quite quick and um because i had to get the it's it's printed and then painted over so they were all kind of done you know last october and then the paint stuff happened after that so all there's there's it's there's a, a weird kind of um <laughs> lack of creativity in it but then it, it it's in because it's done way in advance and then you're kind of just, you know, implementing the production cycle of things. Here I am talking about making stuff again, sorry. Um, but I found that's really interesting and like there's lots of ways that these images could be. They could be straight colour printouts onto some glossy plastic printed surface just as easily. But I really chose to perversely paint them by hand and make them kind of handmade and a little bit wobbly for a reason. What's the reason, James? What's I don't reason? know. <laughs> <laughs> like, because, in a way, the painter is someone that does one thing. Yeah. They paint, generally. Yeah. Speaking. Whereas you're coming at this for, from, like, someone who does lots of different things. And by taking, like, kind of taking on painting, there's something about that. I think there's something... Well, I wanted the surface mm -hmm. of the painted object. Mm. And I'm kind of, and I guess, slightly interested in the uniqueness from the Jolie photographs, um, and 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 how that kind of obviously directly relates to a painting because they're kind of one sort of. But these kind of play a particular game within mechanical reproduction because it starts off on a computer screen, it's printed onto a canvas, um, and I paint over it. But it also what that reverses what a lot of text art does. So you've got people like Rodney Graham, for example, or Michael Craig Martin, and their kind of stencil work with acrylic, which is almost machine-like when it's finished, because you've got lots and lots of tape work that ends up with perfectly crisp lines. So I kind of reverse that to make them a little bit wobbly. So I'm starting with beautiful crisp lines, and then I kind of paint on them a little bit, and they're a little bit wobbly, even though they look completely perfect from a distance. They're quite stained there's only like it's not like a there's only two coats of paint the 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 white is thicker and gloopier to kind of make it stand out and and you and the, and they're fractured as well um and that comes from a screen print you did directly is that kind of just breaking up the text even though they weirdly form back into full letters from a distance they're all kind of broken up and there's they're a little bit more visually dynamic and then they also kind of the layout is directly related to that piece of paper pinned on the wall, which is also a printed canvas. Uh, and that's these French um, road signs. So the font is, is called character, and it's the font from French road signs. And so it is a really direct play on that kind of signifying post-structural debate that goes directly into the Larry Johnson kind of discourse, because he's playing with codes playing with signifiers. It's not necessarily a floating signifier. They actually all mean something. There's this really dense little history in his work that he wants the audience to uncover somehow or else be figure out through reading about it or him talking about it. 
And that's generally what I tend to do is put loads of pieces together and I really, really want the audience to figure it out and think they fucking can. Like, people are smart. And a lot of art can be incredibly didactic. And I play with that didactic kind of information overload as well by... I used to write these elaborate kind of paragraphs of text, which were these kind of playful explainers, but they'd kind of be pretty useless, actually. But they were kind of halfway there, but then not really. So there was always this information put out there, but wasn't all the dots were not joined up. And that also comes from the Gonzalez Torres kind of way of working. The work is never complete until the audience picks up the piece of paper from the ground and takes it home, or picks up the candy from the spill and eats it, and then the work is finished. So you have to, it's, a, it's not necessarily interactive, but it's completed. And that's, uh, was part of something that I was really super obsessed with, that whole provisionality as a phrase as well, in uh, sort of in the States, coming out of the Gillick Tirvanaja years of, of that relational aesthetics thing, um, watching it from very far away in the States, happening in Europe and going like, this is a really interesting way of thinking about art because it was all about talking about art. And that was the art, but it was like, wasn't conceptual wank. It was actually talking about stuff and having friends come together to make food and talk and think about stuff and sometimes record it and sometimes stage it and sometimes make it up and sometimes just let it happen. But it was a, a very, very tied into a French particular scene and a, and a commercial gallery scene as well in between the States and, and France. Um, and then that all got misunderstood and became community art and it was all kind of weird and it's all kind of straight because it involved people suddenly it became community art. Whereas it was a very discreet discourse that was super interesting as a way of making complicated things but having fun with them and making them people focused. I'm rereading the affirmation set now, and it's so, it hasn't, uh, it's, it's really now, but it's Is better it? than now. It's, the it's, 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 it should have been continued, really, in a way. Um, but there's great stuff in that, anyway. Um, just this, you like Christopher Williams as well. Uh, oh, I do. Yeah, so he has a lot of things, he's very like Gary Johnson in that. He's very, a lot of layering, a lot of coding. Uh, These text. are conceptual photographers from yeah. California, in case yeah. you marry, um, I'm just going to say, <laughs> who doesn't know these guys? But. but there's a lot of stuff behind him, and he, yeah. he has a catalogue called The Production Line of Happiness. Oh, right. And you call, and, and that just has text on the cover, even though he's a photographer. And I bought one for seven, I spent way too, I spent 70 Jesus. You're a lot. But, and I, I don't even open it now. So I stare. <laughs> and it's like, too scared to open it. Yeah, so um, I shouldn't have. I was during COVID. I bought it and it was like one of those days. And um, <laughs> you call this been, happiness yeah. engineering. So that, I taught of him. I also taught of Alfredo Jar. He has yeah. studies in happiness where he did yeah. all those things in Chile. 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 Chile's fine. Yeah. And he started to ask people in the street and uh, suddenly it's very happy. Yeah. And, well, they weren't happy, but... It's really funny because I really, really hated Alfredo Yar in college yeah. and, and don't like his work. I find him very, very manipulative and his ways of analysing photography quite reductive. He's got great text work stuff. Yeah, but I really... Yeah, he did a great project in, in Finland with these billboards about migrants on, uh, that were on islands that you could only see through a sequence of ferries. So obscure. It's great. It's like so hard to see the work, but it was part of a year of culture thing, but it was great, yeah. But generally, I, I kind of knew somebody who worked for him and, and, and she had a horrible experience and I kind of, that made me hate him even more. But it kind of, it, it was one of those artists like, I really didn't like Gonzalez Torres first until I really saw the work and then it kind of just completely blew me away, but I thought it was really cynical. But uh, anyway, the Christopher Williams thing, he was also part of my American education, because um, one of my, why are we talking about school so much? Uh, professors had the Angola book that was in Venice a few years ago, that was the first room in the arsenale of these Blaschka flower models that are from Yale. There's a which are similar to the slugs in the National History Museum. You know the slugs? They're made by the Blaschka brothers, who are these 
Hungarian, I think, uh, who made these glass botanicals, which are extraordinary, and they're only in these weird museum collections. And Ireland has some, but anyway, there's a big collection of flowers in Yale, and Chris Williams had this series of black and white photographs, silver gelatin prints, uh, that are all uh, connecting the flowers with human rights um, violations in countries around the world. So there's this sort of list of countries connected to the flowers. It's a really concept, just a joining of two conflicting pieces of information that is becomes a really wonderfully rich, amazingly fascinating work. And uh, so that sort of started my love affair with Christopher Williams. But he does incredibly opaque. And there's also Stephen Prina from that California kind of scene as well, who kind of mixes painting with photography, with text, and, um, and a few others from that particular time. Um, and they, they work, and, and like Stephen Prina works with orchestras and music as well, and it's all very dense, and he's really big in Europe, as is Christopher Williams and stuff. But there's, Christopher Williams has this like really ridiculously insane analytical way of working with photography and looking at commercial photography and analyzing a scene and picking apart the image in a really detailed way, which is, and then has these titles that are 10 paragraphs long describing everything, but, and that's one aspect of it, but. Um, I'm going to bring you back. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to just use this quote. Okay, we're coming up in an hour or so. Oh, no, right. I'm going to use this quote um, by Larry Johnson to just explain text art. You know, I sent it to you. On oh, website. yeah, yeah. So Larry Johnson was interviewed by David Riminelli, who is a really great writer, um, mm -hmm. one of my favorites. Um, he writes for, he used to, he wrote for The New Yorker, and now he's a kind of editor in art form, and yeah. he's just great. And he writes in a kind of, um, I think we talked about this idea of you know, this kind of gay language or this camp language or this kind of uh, patrician language, you know, that's really um, fun, but very smart as well. And very, and the use of words is very, it's very floral. Or, it's a bit um, flighty. It's flighty, <laughs> but yeah. But it's kind of, but it's, I love, I'm very seduced by it. So, but this is, um, uh, Larry Johnson's, and this is very short, it's only five lines, um, his response to David Riminelli. I forget what David Riminelli asked him, but he said... He asked him what was, uh, is your work post-literate? He, he actually highlighted I had to write it down, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so, it was funny, he sent me a quote and I had actually already chosen the quote to talk about. That's weird. <laughs> I had highlighted it in a book a few days ago and I was like, oh, we're we're right. Right. anyway, so okay. we're totally insane keeping um, that like. My job as an editor is to cram a big story into a small space, to forego the short story, to forego anything but the blurb. The idea is to maximize the attention span the reader viewer has for the work of art, which I imagine to be equal, say, to that of a daily horoscope or beauty tip. Yeah, which kind of totally mirrors what I said in the weirdly, mm -hmm. accidentally, by the way, wasn't working that in the press release about like short attention spans mm. so he, he but kind of, he's very self-effacing yeah. in it that he's calling art uh, on the level of a beauty tip or a horoscope well he's also describing himself as an editor yeah not an artist and mm. so he's there to kind of just take bits um, and the thing about an editor is that they 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 look apparently what David says afterwards is that editors don't have a subjective voice they're there to kind of you know adapt other people's language and sharpen it which is sort of what I did with a lot of this that's the kind of approach I was taking accidentally so it was a good quote for us both to find mm -hmm. in terms of using somebody else's work to explain mine mm -hmm. which I really like <laughs> <laughs> it's not about having a not an original thought but it's like there's a but within the kind of Johnson and Rimini there's a big kind of really intense queer kind of art critical voice that sort of absent within Irish art discourse that comes from a larger American scene, like all these artists are gay. So that's what's really interesting about it. That's why I kind of am drawn to them and the reference points from Maplethorpe through to Yakimus or Tom Forth are all these kind of queer reference points that for me to kind of engage with a 
queer identity in, in a really kind of safe way because it's not explicit, but there's a very rich discourse. And within Larry Johnson's, the, so within that particular text as well, it goes on to be very, very analytical about cruising and cruise culture and a cultural kind of significance of it and how you then, how that gets abstracted into art and stuff. So we won't go into that because that's not really part of what my interest, where my interest lies. Um, but it is sort of what was really interesting with some of, he had a, Johnson had a big show in Raven Row and the last shows in Raven Row in London, which was a privately funded art foundation that has sort of slightly, more or less ceased operations, I think, hasn't it? I haven't really, doesn't really do it, but they've, um, funded by Sainsbury's. Sainsbury was Lord Sainsbury's son, so it's loads of money. And not beautiful building off Liverpool Street, not dissimilar to here, lots and lots of panelled walls, so very difficult to show uh, big works on. Um, although, like lots of shows here, big paintings, you just traverse all the panelling. But I thought it'd be really nice to kind of stick with the panelling here and use that as a framing device. But um, yeah, back to Larry Johnson. What am I saying? Well, okay, so I'll, I'll say it again. Um, like this idea, I suppose why I brought up that quote is that what are you actually saying in these works that, you know, we're in this kind of t period of time, this moment where language use, uh, there's a kind of tension of what words you can use. Uh, language is kind of has become very, I suppose, um, anxious, but also artists have become very anxious about what words they use. Yeah. You know, you were even talking about your press release. I don't mind sharing this, but you're talking about you're using perhaps a lot in your press release. <laughs> yeah. And I thought it was interesting that uh, I remember. Which um, I took out. Yeah, you took that perhaps, but there was loads of perhaps in it. There was, and, yeah. And, and it's kind of, that's something I, I always find that, you know, you're referencing people like um, I am, Larry Johnson, uh, David Riminelli. I feel that that world, or, or that postmodern, those young postmoderns, whatever they are, when they there's a there. kind of, they're, they're the unapologetic, you're talking about the, the queer art scene, there's an un unapologetic way in which they maneuver in the art world yeah. and I always feel there's the art scene has become very apologetic for or artists have become very apologetic for what they are so they have to go use words like perhaps I, I can't actually say say something very stupid and brazen right and um, that there's something about that and do you feel that that's that that's creeping up or well you see I, I, yeah so I, I, I don't think it's 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 sort of part insecurity. It's not like I'm a what's that silly phrase? Um, I can't remember anyway. Um, where you you're you're not. It's lacking. It's sort of a lack of confidence. It's it's not. Um, oh my god. Uh, yeah, I can't remember the phrase now. It's that stupid phrase where people are pretending to let the confidence to be something and they think they're faking it. Anyway. Um, Fake humble or something. Yeah, but. And it's not being a bystander either, that other horrible new phrase. That's imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome, that's it, yes. Uh, so I don't have that, but it's a little bit of that. It's a little bit of insecurity. It's a little bit about being not super confident, but then it's also like you're still having to put stuff out, the urge to do that, so you have to do it. But also I think there's a confidence within that particular, there's that gay mafia kind of, you know, cliche of these guys like Riminelli, who's like big art critic for Art Forum and like, the influencing a whole bunch of stuff and getting all these guys into all these shows because they're in charge and it's like bullshit. But that's also, they've kind of turned it upside down. It's like that reclaiming of the queer thing and being super kind of, you know, using it as a powerful voice rather than a kind of a sign of uh, uh, the other. So, do you, find, you said I don't, to me before about this idea of insecurity you have about the object being a powerful thing or being something that can kind of, you know, do you still have that insecurity about the art object itself doing the thing you hope it does or, you know. Did I say that ever? I don't know. You said something like that. I know you did. I have, I have, it, I have it down here. No, I totally believe in everything I make. Well, I think, you know, there's, it's, isn't it funny, all these art, art art's a silly mm. production you're making these odd things all the time, of course. They're, I mean, I, I've, you, you, some artists are, have like a 
profound confidence in their the genius of the things they make that they're adding to the world and the world of thinking and art history and visual culture and stuff and mm, I'm not so sure that that's the right way to approach things and you should be a little bit more modest about it maybe um, but it's there's because I think that the a lot of the times when you're making work like the decision to stop making or to make something is is quite random sometimes and I think I've kind of built that into the way I kind of approach stuff because I can kind of almost almost do anything and it's not that I'm trying to be some sort of polymath it's just like I'm I I'm interested in lots of different things and interested in trying different things and, and interested in not being terribly consistent. Although I find that there's, a, there's, a, there's loads and loads of patterns through what I do in terms of ideas, but there's, they all get jumbled up a little bit, but they do come to conclusions at certain points. So like the films I found really brought together lots of complicated ideas and you've got a, a straightforward video, even though it might be relatively incomprehensible, <laughs> but it's still like there's different, there's, I worked with actors working from scripts in a very cinematic -y kind of way. So there's loads of ways in. It's not completely obscure. Um, and, I, and I, you know, did not want to make documentaries about these complicated ideas and make that film essay thing. I wanted to kind of narrativize it because that's a way into understanding something that's complex rather than actually mapping it out in a documentary format, no matter how innovative that can be. Um, and artists have like taken that and, and, and done it in lots of incredibly interesting ways and complicated ways that don't end up on TV and stuff. Um, so like within, yeah. Are you going to paint again? Yes. Yes. How do you think other painters are going to feel about that? I don't care. I don't, do you think painters care about me painting? Yes. <laughs> no, they don't. Mm -hmm. Do you think painters care about yes. me painting? They do. I want to see more. Yeah. I mean, I think I did these very, no, I did these very quickly. So if I, I kind of reckon if I had like a year run up to something, I'd do something different. But what I really liked were the limitations. I really like structures. I really like to create very tight structures for them to kind of explore and burst out of. So with this, it was really important to have like just the red, green and blue stripes and not go into loads of other colors and deal with other spectrums or try to translate that full colour spectrum into a painting thing because that would take years and in the same way that I didn't I like the limitations of the, the way I've confined the process to this size and, and a range of particular ideas that it has a very particular structure that then can be kind of picked apart and, and kind of made rich by just struggling with that and in the same way with this it was just like I, like, I wanted it to be very repetitive and very mechanical, uh, and yet it's not. It's very handmade. And then, you know, there might have been more paintings if I'd had like an extra six months between all the other ones that would be. I had a notion first that there would be maybe four different types of things that would be mixed. So there's just three. And where did you get the quotes? Sure, made them up like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They are. They're just all made up. So I mean, they're they're they kind of they're supposed to read like memes or f sound slightly familiar, but they're just these statements about art making, really. And it is sort of art about art, which is like one of the biggest crimes, apparently, in this day and age, is to make art about art. But you know, it's always art about art. Fuck yeah, it's always about <laughs> art. But uh, I mean, some. But that means it's not like there's certain people in certain institutions and agencies that really don't see a value to that because they think that's that they're doing something different which is a complete fallacy um, and, and a really disservice to the whole business not business creative experience of what art can be and do but yeah so they're 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 generally comments <coughs> i love the way we're sitting beneath the dead white men mentors <laughs> who are falling down the stairs of history so that's a kind of a combination of that's partly a, in my Roger Casement film I have a, a text piece that comes up at the same font as well that I've been using for the last 15 years um, and it's about him climbing there's no need to climb the stairs of Irish history which was a, a, one of the f key phrases he uses in his, in his, ex, his sentencing speech to when he was executed for treason, high treason so then this is the opposite of that and it's sort of the, I started with like it's 
even though I started with Barbara Kruger and, and Jenny Holzer, I don't want to be them. And equally, I don't want to be Lawrence Wiener and Georg, uh, John Giorgio or Ian Hamilton Finley. So they're like the dead white men. That's what Larry is. Larry's like a combination of Lawrence Wiener, Larry Johnson, Larry Grayson, maybe. I don't know. Uh, Larry's List. The whole bunch of different Larrys that that can be. Um, and yeah, so that's... And then the other one's like about the... When we were looking at the lots and lots of texts, there's a lot of white male artists who dominate the field. And a lot of them are just saying really stupid shit that doesn't really have any impact or meaning. They're these sort of lyrical, nonsensical sentences that are made into giant neon signs that get stuck on buildings. But that, I think so that's, that's what I was trying not to do as well. And, and, and commenting on that and working against it and, and trying to not necessarily make fun of it and be ironic about it, but kind of find a way through that by actually commenting on it and then mixing it up. Because up here you've got like two that are fairly sexual. So you've got like, he turned to Joseph and appeared invaluable for once and happy as Larry, he entered to Lawrence without resistance. It's like, Ew. there's something going on there. That's, there's a story that's totally not being elaborated on. And yet it's sort of between Ronan's favorite of how much he prepared to suffer in banal ways, which is, because it's sort of, it is all related to these kind of, that meme language, meme language, the Jerry Gagosian, whatever, zone of new post, post, post art criticism, <laughs> which is just ridiculing everything, but being embedded and implicated in it constantly. It's like ripping all these big art collectors and then spending weekend in Miami Basel with them because they paid for everything. Yay! And there's no problem with that, right? It's just like completely contradictory. That's always been the case though, isn't it? And um, ask Ronan. <laughs> He's written a book about it. <laughs> he has. <laughs> um, will we ask some questions from the audience? Does anyone have any questions? I won't put you on this. Sorry, we're taking so much time. I know it's been fascinating. I just have kind of comments more than a question. I'm just enjoying the rebelliousness of the show. Um, I, I, I think that it's architecturally the contrast between like a room like this and then these works that are a little bit like anti nice house or something and I like that you forced the viewer into like a kind of a difficult space where we actually do have to stand back and work to see it mm. and even for me like I have astigmatism in my eyes so when I have my glasses off I'm seeing them as green when I have them on I'm seeing them more as red and I'm like, wow, this is pretty trippy. And I do really like, because you were kind of saying that there, I think you were saying that there isn't a translation, but there is. Like, I know that you weren't trying to translate one work into another work. Like this into this? Yeah, but... Oh, they're connected. There's, yeah, the connection I do find, um, I do find it really enjoyable, and I find that... Um, I think about the, the photographs, like the individuality of them, you know, the kind of anti-photography vibe as well, yeah. um, and the anti-painting vibe as well, like, 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 like there, is, there is a kind of, the only word that's really coming is like rebellion that I'm kind of enjoying. I mean, it's funny, isn't it? Because it's like, yeah, such a metal on those are street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've shown who's boss with my stripes. Yeah. But that's what's funny, isn't it? Like, it's like the rebellion is always, like, there's a lot of art and activism stuff which actually goes, has the same net result as what is maybe happening here because it stays within a very small group of people and has very little influence into a larger cultural sphere directly. It's indirect, of course. Art is the center of the universe of course, for everything. Everything stems from art, but, um, and it does kind of a lot of the times. But um, with the stripes, and I mean, I never, I did an in-between publication with a German artist 
an earlier zine publication with James as well called Stripes Etc., which was with Philip Guffler, who was looking, and a German artist who I met um, in a show in Germany, and he had been making a work around um, um, French and English minimalist stripey kind of work. Anyway, it was convoluted as well, but I liked the convolution. We kind of met in these kind of narrative worlds of painting and minimalism and um, stuff. And uh, that was a chance as well to sort of look broadly across the history of stripe painting, because it's quite vast and, and have a bit of fun with it. And like the back cover of it was the certificate of authentication that Daniel Moran wrote for his stripe paintings, because he started off just taking striped awning from a canopy and framing it, like stretching it on a canvas and saying, that's a painting, that's a striped painting, that's legitimate. And, but he's subs and then he's put stripes on everything. So he's like the stripe guy from France. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just funny how he had to, like, to enter into the marketplace. He had to have that. I mean, we don't really have certificates of authentication much anymore. It's, a, it's rare, right, Ronan? I'm just looking at you for like, have you, do you ever issue them for no. things that are ambiguous? It's very so well documented now. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it was also things that maybe weren't necessarily art and they needed to be told they were art by having a cert. Mm -hmm. Certifies that this is actually an art object. But even within that, the language is really funny. It's kind of like ridiculously bureaucratic. So totally French. Like loads and loads and loads of rules as to why this is what it says it is and how you have to keep it and respect it and love it and you know pay for it. So... Like, when I think, like, for me this is really important, this show, because it's text as art in the gallery in Ireland. And, like, if art is about art, then hopefully some people have seen it and they go, oh, I, I, I can do that, or I can apply text onto a thing. It gives right. them permission. I think that's how artists work. They need permission of what is gone to do something new. So now there's going to be a glut of text art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe for a moment. It should be only for Well, a I think with our publication as well, as well we've been, yeah. like, we're on issue three now, n later in the year, and we're also doing an exciting publication. Number four is in the works mm -hmm. too, which is great. And it's completely primary text. I mean, teeny tiny bit of imagery, but really it's all words, and it's, it's been fantastic to just be so limited. And yet the work is so diverse, and it's so broad in terms of what's possible in that. And it's um, very hard to get artists to give give you a text and not have an image attached in some form. Yeah. But either the text, like a meme, it's like the text is on the image, and we like we've had we've conversations with artists that know it's on text, and we come up with the text, and it's not that we think they're absolutely seductive, but I think it's saying a you know it's making a statement that text can survive yeah. by itself in some form. Well, art. yeah, I mean, but with. There's been a few graphic. There has some, yeah, yeah. I mean, allowances. Down to me, yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, that's another yeah, day's work. Um, um, any more questions? Go Could you say something about the, the painting on the left there? Which is, I don't see text. In there isn't, that's, no? That's my favourite one. Oh, is it? Yeah. Well, the, I like uh, that. Amongst the visuals. Oh, right. Yeah, I mean, that, that was. Again, just trying to do something a little bit different. They're kind of related to the, the same size and ratio as the photographs, right? So that was the connection. And then um, with a lot of the photographs, I had reference photographs that I would either combine to make these images. And so I was just using a direct source. So that's like a, a Tom Ford ad for tights. And, it, and I was sort of, I'm slightly obsessed with finding things that are red, white and green. So I came across this image and it's red, white and green tights and that I've now, they're printed and then painted over and stuff. So that's the same with the one downstairs is a J.W. Anderson ad which um, of Chloe Sevigny wearing, holding a handbag which has got different colours but there was just all that tubular stuff and arms that I kind of just thought it was a really good match with these. They kind of just came across my feeds in the last six months and just kept them. So I just thought they would be, it'd be, it's sort of like a source, but then it becomes a primary thing. And, and it's also, 
there's a lovely visual complexity with that because I don't think it's sort of hard to read as to what it is because it's sort of a photograph and it's sort of a painting and then it's embedded in the striped things and it's all a bit wrong and it kind of then if you think about it it's kind of then reveals that it actually is a painted photograph which is what the whole invite is all about saying like these are all just photographs and then haha you see it gets back to Larry Johnson <laughs> so the reason why I love Larry Johnson so much is that he was his text work were basically these um, strange little animated cells like painted he basically used um, like animation, an animation cell from Scooby-Doo, uh, a, a, a tree with snow on it, and had a caption in a thought bubble. And he was, when I first came across him, he was included in a tons of these photography shows. So suddenly you've got photograph, image, 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 and you've got this like graphic thing, which is so not a photograph. But it was using all the mechanisms of photography to create something that's very graphic. and. And, and also just slightly out of, just pre-digital. So that crossover moment where all that analog stuff becomes a little bit antiquated and really kind of then slightly fetishy because it's like, oh, he's using lithographic film and drawing on top of it and printing it through it in a dark room using all the, the, the machinery that you would use to print a photograph, but it then becomes this graphic thing. So that was sort of... Um, and that's interesting when you the talk connection. about the right now thing. Like Gary Indiana has this idea when he's talking about Larry Johnson. That's about how the right now is really ephemeral and artists work in the right now. Yeah. And, and it's kind of, um, it's a brave act to just make a gesture in the right now because you don't have time to reflect. You know, it, it goes by so quickly, so it's an ephemeral moment. Yeah. So there's something about art um, existing in the right now and then disappearing and just, you know, not becoming yeah. permanent. Well, there's a lovely discussion around some of those essays which use that word temporality a lot and that's yeah. sort of like really lovely because that's sort of a lovely way of just dealing with history and time without calling it that, but it is all about that and how the thing I kind of like doing is mixing up the timelines a lot when you're using reference points. So you're doing, you're putting all the wrong things together and that sort of in academic kind of you know highfalutin were uh, wordage and and discussions and stuff that temporality is a, is a big part of understanding how messed up history is it's just a, a way of articulating that particular thing and then the with the flowers and the well not so much these but there's that lovely phrase i kind of came up with which was a mixture of other people's phrases which is that counterfactual temporality which is just like a fancy way of saying fiction because you're just making stuff up which is what lots of art is you're just creating something but I love the language around it love and hate it but um, well it's kind of interesting when you mentioned archive a lot in the beginning and uh, no more and just once so archive is something is about kind of holding on to something you know is it uh, kind of yeah and it's a kind of something that's stored away, you know, and it's like that, so it becomes part of civilization. Whereas I feel, and it is this guy, James Hillman, talks about culture being the opposite of civilization. It's something that just bursts open, you know, like 1968 was a, it was a cultural moment, right. and then it kind of disappeared. And all art events in a certain way, we have a six week run of this, it disappears, you know. Of course, you get in your fancy photographer and take images of it. No, I didn't. Store them out. <laughs> okay, but like it's kind of there's something interesting in that. I think isn't there that art sometimes is trying to be civilization, is trying to hold on to itself a bit too much. Yeah, yeah. Precious no, about itself. Yeah, but see, I don't believe in archives. You know, I've always believed in in an active archive. Mm. That archives are there to be activated, not to, as just repositories and storage units where stuff gets forgotten about. It's about organizing it, utilizing it, making something of it, and you know, researching into it and mm. stuff, finding things. Mm. For me, archives are about finding things, not hiding things. Yeah. And Brit, as you did with uh, Jolie. Yeah. yeah. Good night. <laughs> no more? Are we done? We're done, we're done, we're done. Oh, it's half. It's half an hour. You have to go that was a good thing to stop on, wasn't it? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>